Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, virtual transportation review open house. My name's uh, Jason Reed, and welcome to the meeting, and thank you for uh, joining us tonight to provide input to this important process. I want to first acknowledge that we're having this meeting on the traditional territories of the Wasanich people who have lived on this land since time immemorial. And I ask that each of you uh, reflect and acknowledge in your own way the local territory and that it grounds you in your work this evening. So first, uh, I just want to uh, introduce uh, other uh, members of the Board of Education and management who are who are on this uh, on this uh, uh, in this virtual meeting this evening. So uh, with us, we have Board Chair Tim Denford. We have Trustee Susan Hickman uh, representing the South Zone. And we have Trustee Terry Van Well uh, uh, representing the South Zone. From the management team, we have uh, Superintendent Dave Everwin, Assistant Superintendent Paul McKenzie, Director of Instruction Carly Hunter, Director of Facilities uh, Rob Lum, and Manager of Transportation, Gord Bridges. So uh, the format of the, the meeting this evening will be, uh, uh, I will uh, provide a review of the, of the policy work completed to date. The transportation policy review actually began uh, about this time last year, so quite a bit of work has been done to date, and we'll review that work uh, uh, this evening. Uh, we'll review the next steps in the process, and and then we'll go over uh, the draft policy changes that are that are under consideration. And throughout the pr presentation, uh, if you have uh, questions. Uh, please ask them at any time. And the way uh, in which to ask questions through uh, through this tool is through the Q&A function. Uh, this evening, we're using uh, the Town Hall tool in MS Teams, which is a, a new tool which we're using for the first time. And the, and the way in which uh, you, you engage uh, in the discussion is through the Q&A uh, &A tool. And as I work through the presentation, I will be wat uh, watching for questions and I'll be answering them as, as they come up. And then uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, I'll, I'll catch up on any remaining questions I may not have gotten to, and then we'll uh, close out the meeting. The, uh, we have so far had three in-person open houses. And each of those open houses have taken about an hour and a half. So there's been a lot of questions uh, and, a, and a lot of uh, good good discussion. So we're expecting this virtual meeting may also take uh, roughly an hour and a half. So first, I wanted to just highlight some of the work that's been that's been completed to date uh, when. This policy review was initiated in the fall. Uh, one of the first things that that we did is we uh, we surveyed uh, other school districts in BC, and we sent this survey out to all school districts in BC, and we heard back from uh, about 33. We also did a review of BC school district uh, policy and procedures uh, in a number of other in a number of other school districts, and uh, later in the fall and. Uh, uh, we uh, issued a, a survey to parents, uh, guardians, student and staff. And this survey was issued later in the fall and then the results were reviewed in January 2023. And there was a, a really good response rate to this survey. Uh, there were, uh, I believe, I recall over 400 responses to that survey, so a really good response rate. And then uh, in January, the policy committee reviewed the results of that consultation to date, and they provided direction that uh, then uh, was formulated in draft policy language in April 2023. So the 
The next steps in the process have been uh, the open house uh, zone meetings. Uh, there are four meetings in total. We had an in-person meeting in each of the north zone, central zone, and south zone, and uh, this evening is the virtual virtual open house meeting. Following these meetings and uh, the receipt of feedback uh, through these meetings, the policy committee will uh, review final uh, policy language and, and then uh, move to the next stage of the consultation. So the the policy committee and the, and the board will not be adopting policy amendments in the fall, but will be using the results of this consultation to make uh, final draft amendments. And then uh, in we're expecting uh, early in the winter of 2024, the board would then provide notice of uh, an intent to amend policy and that would provide for a further two months of, of consultation. So there'll be a, a lot of time to uh, review this uh, policy because this is uh, an important policy. And then the intention is for the policy to be implemented for the 24-25 school year. So I, I just wanted to highlight at this point uh, that meaningful consultation is, is a real priority for the board particularly for a service that is that is this important to families. Uh, one thing, uh, well, we learned many things from the from the survey, but one thing we learned was just how important this service is for families. And uh, the, the reason we're using this open house format to gather feedback is to is we want to we want to make sure we get this right. And so we want to make sure that uh, the feedback that we receive is is informed by an, an understanding of of the of what is possible uh, and what we've learned uh, what we've learned through this process. So first, I wanted to briefly go over the current policy, and the the current policy. Uh, which is in place, has been in place in this school district for uh, for many, many years. Uh, and the policy provides for establishing routes that transport students living outside uh, what are called walk limits to and from their nearest catchment school. And so their nearest catchment school would be their uh, regular program school, uh, whether, uh, whether it's uh, elementary, middle or secondary catchment. Policy 21 also uh, requires that the transportation system be operated within, within the operating budget established by the board. And this, uh, uh, the reason this is important is uh, school boards uh, are not required to provide uh, a transportation system. There's no legislative standard or, or regulation that requires uh, uh, a system to be in place. And so every board of education in the province that has uh, a transportation system has established it through policy. And and uh, and with any transportation system, it is impossible to meet uh, all of the demands that may exist. And so uh, it, it uh, a, a, sig a significant parameter that guides what the system looks like is how much budget is is allocated to the system. Policy also provides that uh, courtesy riders uh, may ride on existing routes only if additional capacity is available. Policy 21 includes that when necessary to address a concern of safety or to serve district program or to serve a district program catchment area, additional school transportation may be provided. And policy 24 uh, clarifies that programs of choice, which include French immersion, are established without transportation assistance. And uh, I will just highlight that uh, bullet four and bullet five has been uh, uh, noted as a potential inconsistency uh, that was uh, that was discussed and addressed uh, through policy. Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the the 
the things that was looked at in in through the policy review is how to optimize service uh, for uh, and, and for what purpose? And so I'll discuss that uh, a little bit more in a few slides. So I also wanted to take a few minutes uh, just to highlight Administrative Procedure 560. Um, and I'll first just briefly uh, note that uh, Policies uh, like Policy 21, uh, bus transportation, are established by the Board of Education. And then based on that policy and consistent with that policy, administrative procedures are developed by the superintendent. And so what we were talking about was policy, and what we're talking about now is administrative procedure. Uh, the administrative procedures uh, really outline the procedure for uh, application and, and registration and the details of how the how the how the system operates and these administrative procedures have been uh, have been in place for uh, a, a very long time and so uh, there's nothing in them that is uh, that is uh, new or recent one of the things i wanted to highlight in administrative procedure 560 is that this administrative procedure prioritizes registrations in the following order. It first prioritizes students attending their catchment, so their regular program catchment school from outside the walk limits. Then second, it prioritizes students attending district programs, including French immersion. And then third are students attending a school of choice. Now, a, a school of choice would be a student not attending their uh, regular catchment school, but they're they're attending an alternate school, but they're not attending it to um, to attend a district program. They may be attending a school program such as an academy, but but uh, not a district program. A district program would include French immersion. Uh, it would include uh, as an example, another example, the IB program in Parkland. So uh, I wanted to spend a, a little bit of time uh, just going over some of the observations we have made uh, over the years about the system and uh, and uh, basically what we knew when we were when we were going into this policy review. And First, uh, first, I can take. I'll take a bit of time to go through a few of the questions that I've seen come in. Do concerns and safety include issues that happen between students uh, while riding on the bus? Uh, yes, they do. And we will get to uh, safety in a few moments. So, uh, Spanish specific observations. Um, one thing that we've we've always known about the system is. Uh, in Saanich, because the Saanich Peninsula is relatively contained, Saanich is able to serve a greater proportion of students relative to many other school districts. And uh, the, other, the other thing that we've known about our system is that the combination of geographically contained catchments 
and higher elementary walk limits has resulted in service variation for courtesy riders traveling to their catchment school from within the walk limits. And the reason for this is uh, we have eight elementary catchments. And if you look at where those schools are placed on the peninsula and you draw uh, a four kilometer circle around each of those schools, there is actually not much of the peninsula that's left. And so uh, the result of that has been that many uh, elementary schools, uh, many elementary students traveling to their catchment school on the bus uh, are courtesy riders. Uh, and the other result is that there is a pretty significant variation in service between schools just depending on the geography and depending how the routes have been established for the middle and secondary schools. And so uh, there are some uh, schools, uh, elementary schools in the in the district that have pretty good service. They have uh, three or four buses serving them. And then we have uh, other um, other elementary schools in the district that have uh, very little bus bus transportation, uh, relatively speaking. The other thing that we've known is that service for district programs varies significantly between the zones. For example, there are more options for North, North Zone students traveling to a French immersion school than there are for South Zone, South Zone, South Zone students. Uh, if you're in the North Zone uh, and your uh, child is in French immersion, uh, there are way more options uh, to uh, get get to your school on the bus. Where, whereas in the South Zone, those uh, options are pretty much non-existent. So there, there really isn't the option to travel by bus to Keating Elementary or Bayside if you live in the Cordova Bay, Lockside, or Prospect Lake catchments. The other thing we've known uh, for, for years is that the four kilometer walk limit for elementary age students has historically been raised as a concern. And it's uh, uh, not that surprising uh, that uh, that we would feel that four kilometers is too far uh, for an eight year old to walk. And so it's something that's been uh, raised as a concern for uh, for a number of years. The the history on the on the walk limits, though, the walk limits that we have uh, many other school districts also have those same walk limits because they were at one time a provincial uh, guideline. The province used to provide guidelines. They don't. They haven't for decades. But but many years ago, uh, these were the guidelines the province uh, province uh, uh, had issued. And so, in districts where pols this policy hasn't been reviewed for many years, uh, many of those districts continue to have these these. Uh, walk limits. The other thing we've known uh, uh, for for some time is that as routes have evolved over time to meet many transportation needs, wait times and route times have become an increasing concern expressed by parents. So as we um, as we have uh, over the years tried to uh, accommodate many transportation needs. Uh, We've done so by adding stops, by uh, adding little bits onto routes here and there, and the and the result over time has been uh, some routes that are very long, and in some cases, students waiting uh, quite a period of time uh, after after the bell goes before before they're picked up. The other uh, thing we've known uh, more in recent years, as our as our ridership has has really grown is that uh, late registrations and ghost riders, so those are uh, uh, those who register but do not ride, have become a significant challenge to the registration and route planning process in advance of school startup. Okay. So I have a, a question. So, uh, why are French immersion students last on the, the list in the administrative procedure? 
So I've just uh, gone back to the administrative procedure slide. Uh, French immersion students are second in the list uh, in the administrative procedure. So the first priority are students attending their catchment school and second priority are students attending district programs, including French immersion. Next, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the, the provincial survey and uh, the results of our review of other policies. So uh, one thing we learned from the provincial survey is that Saanich serves a greater proportion of students overall uh, when compared to uh, other school districts with similar geography. And when I say similar geography, we were looking at districts that have a combination of um, suburban and, and rural areas. And so some of those districts included uh, uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith. And in Nanaimo Ladysmith, they're serving about 14.8% of their student population, so about half of what we're serving. It included Comox Valley, which was 25%, uh, Central Okanagan, which was 19%, Mission, which was 21%, uh, Chilliwack, which was uh, comparable to uh, Saanich at about 29%. The other thing we learned from the survey is that of the 33 districts that responded, 15 reported having lower, lower walk limits, with those walk limits typically being lower at elementary schools. Most districts with lower walk limits, uh, we, we found also designated uh, maximum walking distance to bus stops. And uh, this is something that we do not have in policy, uh, but we did see in a number of other policies. And it does it does make sense if you're going to um, designate a distance that a, a, a student would receive transportation as an alternative to walking to school, then there should be some parameters around how long, how far they're going to have to walk to the bus stop as well. What we also saw in, in, in some policies was minimum spacing of bus stops. So some policies stated that bus stops couldn't be any closer uh, to one another than one kilometer. Uh, and uh, some policies designated urban areas as non-service zones. So an example of that was Chilliwack. They had, a, they had lower walk limits, but then they designated their, their a downtown core area as a non-service area because it had uh, good, good uh, sidewalks, streetlights, etc. Most of the districts that responded reported that fees uh, were not being charged. Most recently developed policies reflected an increased focus on active transportation. So the there were two or three policies that had been uh, uh, amended. Uh, within the last two or three years, and those policies all had an increased focus on active transportation. Many policies had language limiting travel time for students traveling to their catchment school. So some policies uh, had uh, actually had uh, specific time limits, uh, uh, such as no student will have a travel time exceeding 45 minutes to their catchment school. And many policies uh, specified that routes wouldn't be altered to accommodate courtesy riders. And the intention of this was to uh, manage down, uh, to manage the route times within a, within a reasonable time zone. So um, next I'm gonna talk about the, the results from uh, from the from the survey that went out to parents, guardians, staff, and students last fall. But first, I'm going to check in on uh, questions. Okay. So, uh, question: Why is French immersion considered a program of choice? It's been five decades since Canada adopted the Official Languages Act. French should uh, be not just encouraged, but facilitated at the district level, the same as English schools. 
without transportation barriers to students whose parents are unable to drive their children to French immersion schools. So, um, so uh, oh, there, there's a there's a few things uh, 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 that I'll go through in, in response to that question, and that's and that question came up in uh, the the open house meetings. Uh, it's de definitely been a, a a topic of of hot debate through through this review. Uh, I I, I will uh, kind of step back. Uh, uh, first, on the provision of transportation services. So, as I noted earlier in the presentation, uh, school boards are uh, not required uh, to have a transportation system at all. So, uh, a transportation system is something that is uh, implemented and established through um, the board's decision to implement a, a policy. And so, there's no requirement for a board to have uh, transportation for any students uh, being being transported to school. And uh, in, in fact, uh, there is no transportation in uh, the Victoria School District at all. Uh, many of much of the Victoria School District is is more urban uh, than the Santa School District, but there are also neighborhoods in uh, the greater Victoria School District that are not uh, di not that different than than ours. So when a board decides to uh, establish a transportation system, it has the uh, discretion to uh, uh, decide how much to invest in this, that system, how much a budget will be allocated uh, into that into that system. And uh, the the funding uh, that can be uh, realistically allocated into a transportation system, uh, is is always going to be limited such that uh, a school board is going to need to to make choices. Now, uh, with with respect to French immersion, uh, there are uh, in Canada there are uh, charter rights for uh, uh, francophone uh, families to access a French immersion program. Uh, those uh, those obligations and those rights exist with the Francophone School District, which is a, a, a provincial school district, and they have um, a French uh, uh, French immersion schools uh, uh, located in the in the Victoria area. Uh, the requirement and obligation for the Santa School District to uh, deliver a French immersion uh, in response to those charter rights. Uh, basically doesn't exist in our school district. And so uh, a, the reason uh, why French immersion is a district program because is because the Board of Education is under no obligation to provide French immersion, just like they're un, under no obligation to um, provide transportation services. So uh, both of those are a choice that boards of education make. And then uh, once a board has established a transportation system, uh, uh, it is uh, it is going to be limited in its capacity. It isn't going to be able to serve all students in uh, in uh, in the district, uh, all families in the district for all programs. Uh, there are many many programs beyond beyond just French immersion. And so uh, the the school the school board uh, needs to decide how is it going to prioritize the system, and uh, in in our school in our school district, uh, French immersion transportation has been a possibility in the north zone, uh, basically because of how the routes work uh, overall in the system. Those opportunities exist. Uh, there is no transportation. Uh, in the cell zone for for French immersion, and it wouldn't be uh, uh, realistic to uh, implement it in in the cell zone without uh, really uh, um, scaling back uh, the the services for students to their catchment school. And so, uh, I guess that that's a quite a long winded way of saying that. 
uh, that the board has to make choices around uh, how it's going to st serve students and uh, prioritizing French immersion uh, programs in the system would be at the expense of providing transportation for students and potentially uh, uh, meaning some some students couldn't access an education program at all uh, if they didn't receive if they if they were not transported to their regular regular program school and so that's that's a, a perhaps a lengthy overview of of what the discussion in the in the last uh, in the last few open houses have been around that topic. Okay, I think I'm all caught up on the questions. Yeah, if you have any any other questions, uh, please. Yeah, just give me a moment. I'm reading one more comment. Okay. I think there there's another uh, another uh, similar comment on French immersion, which I believe I've addressed. Oh. So uh, I'll just go through the survey from last fall. So uh, we had a, a really good response rate to this survey. And I'd say the, the first thing that the, the number one thing that we learned through this survey was that transportation uh, services are very important to families. Uh, that came through in 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 most of the responses, and we we intentionally had uh, many open ended questions uh, because we uh, we uh, I think it's good practice to have that opportunity and not not presume what the answers may be. So we received a lot of commentary and feedback uh, on on parents describing just how much they countered on the transportation system. The the other thing that we uh, that we saw in 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 the results was from many an expectation that uh, well a desire and for many an expectation that that service levels needed to be increased overall pretty much every all aspects of service levels. And one of the uh, one of the non-open-ended questions was, what should the board consider when determining how transportation routes and services are established? And uh, you'll see in the table in the slide, we uh, uh, you could choose all that applied. And so we had distance to catchment school, distance to bus stop, active transportation options, rider age, student vulnerability, uh, route route times, wait times, and courtesy riders programs of choice. And you can see there was strong support for many considerations and some uh, uh, and and some people who completed the survey selected every single one of those as a priority. Uh, the challenge with that is that it isn't possible to prioritize every one of these and many of them are in direct uh, direct uh, conflict with others, for example, distance to spot, distance to a bus stop versus route time. When we when we really dug into and read the 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 open ended responses, one of the things we noticed that uh, when a theme was identified as a single priority, it was most often route times and length time uh, route times and wait times uh, for the bus. And many of those responses describe student experience with long route times or uh, having to wait 30 minutes after bell time, as an example, to, to pick up the bus. Road safety and student vulnerability were uh, 
also often a focus in many responses. Many responses noted that safety and serving vulnerable students should be prioritized over active transportation and environmental concerns. Many commented on limited active transportation routes in some areas, that active transportation was age dependent, and that active transportation was more challenging during uh, the winter months when it's dark and, and wet and cold. Many respondents, <coughs> excuse me, were, were opposed to fees. However, excuse me. Many, many respondents were opposed to any fees. However, more respondents were in favor of fees to maintain services if necessary or to enhance services. And many respondents that were not otherwise in favor of fees were supportive of a late registration fee if it would improve the timeliness of registrations and the effectiveness of route planning before startup. So, before I get into the direction from the policy committee following that, just going to take another read through the questions. Okay, uh, I don't think uh, here, uh, I'll just read through the next few questions that have come through. I don't think we're asking for French, French immersion students to be prioritized over others. It's more about giving them equal ridership consideration that the English program students uh, receive. Okay, again, uh, this is a policy choice that the Board of Education uh, is making, and uh, it is, uh, uh, because French immersion is a program of choice uh, and it is a it is a district program and it's a program of choice. Uh, this board and many boards uh, uh, have determined that ridership for district programs is our as a courtesy rider. And the, and the reason is the reason for this is because the capacity of the bus system uh, is limited. And so the the first priority is getting students to uh, the, the first priority in our existing policy, which has been in place for decades, and in the policies of other school districts, is uh, generally to get students to a regular program catchment school. Uh, and that and the rationale for that is that it provides every child the greatest opportunity to access an educational program. And so that is the, the reason for uh, uh, the policy and other policies prioritizing ridership to a regular program catchment school. And it's because the, the system just doesn't have the capacity to do that. So transport students to the regular program catchment school, but then also transport students from throughout the district to um, uh, schools offering district programs. Next question. Can you please help me understand how French immersion is both a program of choice and yet continues to have catchment boundaries? Uh, yeah, it is It is a district program and it is uh, delivered um, uh, at the elementary uh, level uh, in, two, uh, in two different locations. And so to facilitate uh, enrollment in those two schools, Deep Cove Elementary and Keating Elementary, there are uh, catchment boundaries, uh, but that is different from a regular catchment boundary. And so the, the policy around transportation has been uh, 
is clear. It's been in place for decades that the intent of the of the system is to transport students to their local uh, regular program catchment school. It, it the intention of uh, the transportation policy uh, has never been to prioritize service to district programs. It's just been a uh, good fortune, uh, particularly in the North Zone, that the routes have have worked for that purpose. Okay, next question. I don't think you have addressed the catchment nature of French immersion while well, it is also a program of choice. Typically, programs of choice are at a particular school. In School District 63, we do not choose the school. It is decided by, by where we live. Okay. That, that's correct. Uh, I'm 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 not sure I understand this question. I think I may have addressed it in the in the in answering the last question. If not, please uh, please repost. Okay. And the next question uh, I've received is quite long, so I think I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going to wait, wait until we get get to the question and answer period to to address this one. OK. So. Uh, the policy committee uh, reviewed all this work that I've just gone through in January 2023, so they reviewed uh, the survey results of uh, parents, students, uh, and staff. Uh, they reviewed uh, the provincial survey of other school boards, and they re reviewed the policy, the broader policy review we did in other districts. And uh, following this review in January, the policy committee uh, requested that staff ass ass assess options to policy that would achieve the following objectives. The first one was to lower the K to five walk limits, considering variation in school geography. The second one was to reflect safety considerations in determining service and routes. Next one encourages and supports active transportation and environmental considerations. Fourth one encourages timely registration and discourages ghost riders. And those are students who register and then do not access. Uh, focuses route design on optimizing service for students entitled to service by policy. Now this, this was in response to uh, what we saw uh, in the survey uh, around uh, there being concerns with the length of routes, the length of wait times for students that are attending their uh, regular program catchment schools, and it also reflects what we've uh, what we saw in other provincial policy. Now the next bullet uh, clarifies how courtesy riders are uh, directed staff to clarify how courtesy riders are defined, and that includes removing contradictory reference to serving a program catchment area. And what that refers to is uh, earlier on in the. I will just. Move back. So current policy. The Second bullet from the bottom, when necessary to address a concern of safety or to serve a district program catchment area, additional school transportation may be provided. It doesn't say will be, but it says maybe. And then the next bullet after that is programs of choice, including French immersion, are established without transportation assistance. And so the, the direction from the policy committee, if you look at the, the last few bullets, is saying, we our system is limited and we need to focus uh, the, the resources of the system first and foremost on optimizing 
uh, service for students entitled by policy. And for decades, that's been that's been uh, transporting students to their regular catchment school. So the the intent here, uh, I believe, is to make sure that we deliver good service for those who are entitled to to service, and then uh, clarify how courtesy riders uh, are defined in the policy. And then the last bullet is reflects consideration in supporting vulnerable students. So I'm just going to do a quick check to see if there's any further questions. And then we're going to get into the policy. Yeah, I have a I have a question. Is there an email to submit questions for those on devices not supporting by supported by Q and A? So I've opened my mail, uh, and if you do not have access to Q and A, you can email. I'm just going to put my email address in the chat. So I've entered my email address in the chat. If if you're uh, having issues with the Q&A, you can uh, email me directly and I've got my email up on another screen here, so I'll see it. OK, another question is, can you uh, please speak to how capacity is managed for international students who are placed in homestay after the transportation uh, request deadline. Do you have data as to their actual ridership rates? Uh, I do not have data on the ridership of uh, international students, uh, but if um, if they're registering after the deadline, they would be registering generally as a as a courtesy rider, I believe. I believe that's correct. If if there's anyone on the call who uh, who knows more about that, okay. Hey, there's a, a comment. I would welcome fees if it could contribute to supervision on the bus. Uh, the drivers can't are not supervising uh, while they're driving, so it's a comment. Thank you for that. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put up the actual policy on the screen and I'm just going to do a, a walkthrough of uh, of the changes and the reasons for them. Okay, so the, the the document on the screen are the proposed changes to policy 21, and I'll I will just go through uh, each of these. So the the first uh, change, which is bolded in green, is the addition in the general statement at the beginning that support for active student travel is an important part of a comprehensive approach to student transportation. 
this is a general statement. Uh, and uh, on the second page, you'll, when we get there, you'll see there's, there's some more specifics around that. You'll see there's quite a few changes in uh, uh, paragraph one. So the you'll see first that the walk limit for kindergarten has kindergarten to grade five has been reduced from four kilometers to 2.5 kilometers. And uh, in 1.1, You'll, there, there are revisions that I, that I would categorize as just cleanup of the language. Uh, the language uh, has always uh, uh, stated that transportation uh, was pri is prioritized for uh, students traveling to their nearest catchment school, uh, and uh, other uh, elsewhere in policy clarifies that that's regular program catchment school. Uh, and so we've just modernized the terminology because that's how we refer to it. Uh, today. You'll see in 1.2, uh, we've added uh, a minimum walk time to a bus stop. So students entitled to transportation in paragraph 1.1 will not have to travel further than 2.5 kilometers by travel road or walkway to the nearest bus stop. And so uh, I don't. Uh, we didn't have any cases uh, in the district where where that was an issue, but uh, it was something that was missing from policy. So, uh, in theory, uh, uh, it was it would be possible that somebody could have had a a, a longer walk to the bus stop than than uh, than what was actually in a walk limit. And so we've just clarified that in policy. One point three. Uh, clarifies that travel times are optimized for students being transported to their regular program catchment school from outside the walk limits. And so that that's uh, uh, ties back directly to that direction from the policy committee that that uh, routes uh, do need to be optimized because of the long travel times, wait times, and that uh, it is uh, makes sense that they're optimized for the students that are entitled to, to transportation services by policy. Now, you'll, you'll see at the beginning of uh, 1.1, we've added subject to being economically viable, and then we've added a new paragraph to the district will endeavor to establish routes that serve as many students eligible for services under guiding principle one as possible a minimum of 15 eligible students eligible for transportation. Uh, transportation services under guiding principle one are required for a route to be considered economically viable. So the, the reason we added this is that uh, when, when we were looking to how we would lower the K to five walk limit, uh, we, uh, we have mapping software where we're able to lo uh, locate every school, uh, uh, look at all of the routes, and uh, we have uh, we can map the location of all students without any personal information. But we know uh, where uh, you know there's a grade five student attending this school, living on this road. So we have all of that information for the district, and we. Uh, we use that software for a number of planning purposes, and we used it in this case to to really uh, rebuild the routes uh, virtually and and see what was possible. And uh, the the other objective is we know our our system's already at capacity, and so uh, we don't have uh, f funding uh, or budget to to be adding additional routes. So it's uh, in lowering the walk limits for K to five, we wanted to make sure that what we actually did was possible because we didn't want to implement a policy that we couldn't deliver on. And uh, in lowering the walk limits to 2.5 kilometers, what we found is uh, uh, we're gonna, we will be able to make it work in virtually uh, almost all cases. But there were a few uh, few examples or or. Uh, uh, anomalies where uh, there were uh, a small number of students in an area that what had did not receive bus transportation 
Uh, one example is the the northern and the southernmost tips of the Sydney Elementary catchment. There are a, a few students, uh, less than ten, I believe, uh, that are that are in that cat that category, the northern or southern tips, and we have no bus service whatsoever in in those areas. Uh, another example, uh, the third example is uh, uh, the west side of the Cordova Bay catchment on the west side of the highway, kind of the Elk Lake area. There, there are just a few uh, a few kids that live there, and there is no bus service uh, in in that area either. And so, over time, Paul C two says we're going to do everything we can to serve to serve as many students as we can. Uh, but we may not be able to provide service to, to everybody. And so that's why we have this economic uh, viability uh, threshold. Uh, the intention of this is not to reduce service. We're not going to look at a street and say there's only five kids on it. We're not going to run a bus down it. Uh, if uh, the intent, the intention of this is if it's not possible for a bus to realistically serve an area without adding 30 minutes on the route or 20 minutes. If it's not feasible, then we we may not be able to. So that's the intention of number two. Number three, you'll see uh, we've removed the, the text that says when it is necessary to address a concern of safety or to serve a district program catchment area, additional transportation may be may be provided. And so that concept has been removed from policy because the the shift in the focus is to optimize those routes to transport students to the regular program catchment school. And uh, the additions to number three uh, uh, are consideration of significant safety factors, which did exist before. Uh, there's an example of such as a major highway crossing. And there's an addition here or in support of students with exceptional transportation needs. And so those would be uh, students that uh, may have a, a variety of different vulnerabilities. And so I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that the language is quite high level and that is uh, usually that is the intention uh, with policy. Policy is intended to to be high level to stand the test of time and then from here, uh, we look at how how do we operationalize uh, these in administrative procedures. So, uh, paragraph six, uh, we've uh, added a clarifying sentence that seating priority is reserved for those students entitled to transportation under guiding principles one to five. It uh, really uh, clarifies, just clarifies what's in the first sentence, uh, which is that if you're not entitled to service, you may be transported if the legal capacity of the bus has not been reached. And then uh, we, uh, in, in the last sentence in paragraph six, we've added that courtesy riders attending district programs as defined in uh, administrative Procedure 560 will be prioritized over other courtesy riders. And so uh, when we were going through Administrative Procedure 560, there was three, there were three different levels of priority. The first one was students outside the walk limits being transported to their regular catchment school. The second priority was students attending a district program like French Immersion. And then the third priority was everything else. Uh, what we uh, realized as we were going through this review is that policy 21 uh, does not actually state anywhere in it that district program students are prioritized over other courtesy riders. And so this is something that we felt was important enough, uh, fundamental enough to the service that it should be reflected in policy. And so this is an addition to policy one but really to be consistent with what was already in Administrative Procedure 560 for, for many, many years. 
And then the, the other thing that we are going to add to Administrative Procedure 560 is we are going to define what those district programs are. Because we, if we're going to refer to a district program, we should define what it is. I think we all have an understanding of what a district program is. Uh, if you look on our on the school district's website, there's a tab for district programs. So it's well understood what it is, but we felt it was something that should be clarified in administrative procedure. Paragraph seven states that as transportation routes are established to provide optimal service in accordance with paragraphs one to five, transportation routes and bus stops will not be altered to enhance service for courtesy riders. And so this ties into the to the idea that uh, routes uh, there there's room to optimize routes to reduce route times wait times to improve uh, service uh, and. Uh, the intent of these policy changes is to um, ensure that service is optimized for uh, those students that are that are entitled to service by policy, and and those are uh, students traveling to their regular program catchment school. And then number eight is uh, where we expand on what active transportation uh, looks like. So it stating that we will. Um, it will be promoted through a variety of means, including but not limited to uh, working with local governments to address road safety concerns, as well as uh, identifying opportunities to create active transportation routes. We do many of these things uh, already, although I would say historically our focus has been on, on road safety. And so with the implementation of this policy, we would increase our focus uh, working with our munis municipal partners to to create more active transportation routes to school. It also includes you'll see communication to students and building awareness. Now, number nine uh, is that riders will be charged a registration fee and an additional fee for late registration. Late fees are intended to encourage timely registration and improve the effectiveness of route planning prior to school startup. The establishment of fees and any required revisions will be approved uh, by the board. So the the intention here is uh, is to uh, uh, the intention is not to create a, a source of of revenue, uh, but to um, uh, hopefully improve the the management of the system. Uh, the 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 level of the fee would be established by the board, and I I'm I'm not going to presume what the what what that number may be, but I can tell you that the intent is not for the fees to be uh, to be significant. I I, I know uh, in the Souk School District uh, they recently uh, implemented a. Uh, a registration fee, I believe, twenty in the range of twenty-five dollars, and uh, and a late registration fee, which I believe is seventy-five dollars, or in in that range. So, uh, we're, the the figures are are not uh, significant, but the intention is to uh, incent uh, uh, registration on time and to uh, discourage. Uh, registration um, by riders don't who don't who act, end up not riding and one thing we know from history is the the Sanish school district uh, used to charge fees for bus service uh, until about until about five years ago uh, maybe plus or minus a year uh, and five years ago uh, the province provided school district uh, funding uh, with the direction that they use it first to eliminate bus fees. And so uh, prior to that, uh, we, ch we charged about $300 a year to ride the bus. And when fees were eliminated, our uh, ridership went from about 70% uh, to to where we are today. We we five years ago, we went almost to capacity and we've been very close to capacity. and. And our ridership has uh, this year has uh, grow, grown on a number of routes, uh, 
with with the result being that not everybody that wanted to ride was able to ride. And so we're, we're hoping with the implementation of a registration fee, uh, it, it's not going to be $300, uh, that's for sure, but we're hoping that a, a small registration fee will discourage uh, registration on the bus when uh, by those riders that don't eventually uh, use the service. So I'm just going to flip back to the transportation and then I'm going to get back into the question and answers. I haven't received any questions by email. Uh, if uh, if you do have uh, problems getting uh, your questions into the chat function, uh, you can certainly contact me by email tomorrow. Uh, you can uh, uh, call me. My number's on the district website. I'm happy to, to answer any questions in relation to this. Okay, so next question, uh, the first paragraph of the policy states student safety shall be the highest priority in the provision of student services. Uh, the provision provision of student transportation services by the district. What is the procedure for what is the procedure for responding to bus safety concerns? We've had several safety concerns come up in in my group with regards to the to uh, uh, services on my child's route, and they've been reported uh, to the principal, and these issues have been ongoing. And so, uh, this uh, this is a a little bit beyond the the focus on the transportation review, but we we uh, this is a more of an operational matter. What we're talking about uh, tonight is the proposed amendments to. Uh, to uh, to board policy, and uh, we're the the requirements around student safety in in the proposed policy uh, are unchanged. Uh, so it's not not really a, a policy amendment uh, that we're talking about, but it's a issue of operational concern uh, that we have uh, heard from some uh, we have heard from parents this fall. And uh, it is something that is that is being worked on, but I'm not going to comment on that e any further this evening. Where do international students fit within administrative procedure uh, 560? So uh, they would. Uh, International students would uh, fit within uh, administrative 560, uh, I believe the same as uh, domestic students if they're traveling to a catchment school from the location of their of their residence. But they are not specifically uh, uh, highlighted in AP 560 or policy 21. Okay, and then another, I have a specific, uh, in the chat, there's a specific question around uh, registration of an international student for uh, February start. So uh, that's kind of uh, 
beyond uh, beyond what we're focusing on tonight. So I'd recommend that you uh, send that if you send that question to me by email, I could I could respond to it offline. So why haven't all riders not received bus passes yet? And uh, why haven't all riders not received bus passes yet and getting a hard time from the driver when it is out of their control? Okay. So uh, the, the, the challenges uh, operationally that we're experiencing this year are uh, really the result of increased ridership on a number of our our routes and uh, historically the approach uh, in this district which has uh, worked well for many years but uh, perhaps has not worked uh, as as well as we had hoped this fall is that uh, we've always been quite accommodating and trying and attempted to get everybody everybody on the bus including uh, late registrations and uh, in, or, in order to make that happen uh, for many years there's the practice has been uh, to uh, delay the issuance of bus passes uh, in, into the fall. Uh, I, with the with the growth in our ridership uh, and we're, we are having uh, a lot of internal discussions around this uh, I think that the shift in approach for next year, and this isn't a policy matter, this is a operational matter. This uh, the specifics of this are not addressed in in policy, but I will say for for next year, we're having discussions around how how this can be managed in a different way uh, because of uh, uh, the pressure on the capacity of our system, and I think the solution going forward is uh is not uh to put is not to uh, uh accommodate to the same degree as we have late registrations uh there is a limited uh administrative capacity uh within uh within the the district board office and within uh the transportation department uh the transportation department uh uh, they, the staff in the department work very hard on uh, on registering students uh, planning for the beginning of the year. And it, it was uh, uh, really challenged by uh, the, the vast numbers of late registrations that were received uh, uh, just before school start up and through through September. And uh, I think going forward, uh, we we are going to be taking an, uh, an approach of uh, really focusing on uh, the students that register by the registration deadline and ensuring that those students have a bus class to begin the school year and then only following uh, following the processing of all of those registrations received on time uh, would we be looking at late registrations and so uh, that will have uh, other implications uh, in that uh, uh, those who register late may not be on the bus uh, as early uh, as they otherwise would have been. But I think uh, what we're seeing uh, this year is that some some students that registered on time uh, haven't been able to get onto the bus uh, because of uh, because the buses have been full. And so it's something that we we are having a lot of discussions about. And uh, a lot of a lot of work goes into the registration process, and uh, I think what what is happening is we're uh, really stretching the capacity of our system, and we need to look at it a different way. And so that's something that we're having a close look at for next year. OK, 
Okay, next question. Should the goal not be to encourage ridership rather than discourage ridership, whether it is limited ridership or frequent? Should the district goal not be to put their head down and find solutions as to how we can support all of those who want to have transportation as opposed to finding ways to segment kids into different classes so as to provide rationale why they are why they are not entitled to ride and b charge fees in hopes they won't sign up fees are fine if intended to provide more transportation not as a disincentive yeah so first of all i would say that our system is very near capacity most of our buses are are full uh they may not look like they're full at certain points in their routes because when they leave the facilities yard, they're actually empty. <laughs> but at some point in the, in their route, uh, they are full. And so that means uh, uh, we're we're at our capacity as a system. And so uh, we're not in the space of uh, where we can encourage ridership we're in the we're in the space of how do we how do we manage the capacity of our of our system uh, and how do we uh, decide who rides the bus and so the policy has uh, the existing policy has um, always prioritized uh, ridership for students to their regular catchment school uh, and uh, the proposed changes to the policy review are are then focusing on well how do we op you know as the the capacity of our system becomes more and more stretched uh, as ridership uh, may grow then how do we optimize service and so it's uh, it's not a question about how do we get more kids on the bus because we can't get more kids on the bus it is how do we use the limited system that we have in the most equitable way that's possible and the most effective way that's possible understanding that at the uh, at the end of the day it's not it is not possible for everyone who wants to ride the bus to to get onto the bus and uh and that that is uh the challenge of the transportation policy review it is uh it is uh Often what we hear is uh, the system needs to do more, but the problem is the system can't do more. And so uh, what, what we're hoping to hear from each, each of you in the, uh, tonight and, and in the, the follow-up survey, which will be posted tomorrow, is how does the board, how should the board uh, design a system understanding that it's limited and it's not possible to uh, just continue to grow the system and increase ridership. How should the system uh, provide service in a way that's equitable? So next question, can you please send me the contact information for who I can contact on the operational side? of things in regard to student safety. So you can contact me, you can, and I have my email in the chat, so you can contact me tomorrow. So we're at about 8.20, so I've received a few um, questions in my email. So I'll just, I'll go through the first one. So first one, I have a five part question, all related to the final financial aspect. Part one, why is the board not first taking fiscal responsibility for all stakeholders and accessing federal and provincial funding? The federal has earmarked 2.75 billion for the procurement of zero emission transportation. The provincial government has also earmarked 13 million. Souk has, uh, has a 2.5 year lead and has realized a 72% reduction, reduction in energy costs. 
which frees the budget to address more routes in drivers. So we are accessing those funding programs. Uh, we've, uh, we are having two electric buses delivered uh, next month. Uh, and we have funding confirmed for a third one, which will probably be arriving a year from now. And over the past year, uh, we've done a significant amount of work uh, at the district operations office to upgrade the electrical feed and to uh, begin the installation of uh, uh, charging stations. And the electrical feed of the board office has been upgraded uh, so that we will be able to um, uh, add chargers as electric buses are delivered. Uh, we will probably be replacing a bus or two each year, and they will be electric buses. And we now have the energy. We have the electrical infrastructure at the board office to, in the future, be charging. Uh, 20 plus uh, buses and and our white fleet of vehicles. So that work is underway. Part two, why is the policy review ignoring stakeholder interests and reiterating outdated policy going forward by internal interests, specifically district programs? Hey, I think that's more of a statement than a question. Part three, are any Why has the district transportation board taken on the approach to press optimization of a balanced budget when government runs deficits to take the strain on uh, on strain strain of the below economic social demographic? Well, the 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 simple answer is that school boards are are prohibited from by legislation from. Uh, running an operating deficit and school boards have not been funded for inflationary costs and so it's been uh, a struggle for years to to simply maintain transportation services uh, so it, it uh, there isn't the option of running a deficit budget Why is the board addressing policy with the limited capacity of the established fleet versus the national average of 90 passenger bus capacity? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Many of our buses are 84 passenger, and that I believe is the standard. And then another uh, statement that the system needs to prioritize French immersion as not being an elective program. So we, uh, next question, we require bus transport for placement in out of school care program. Although we registered on time, we didn't find out we were in pending status until late July, and we're told we wouldn't be notified until October 1st if we had spots. Will these dates improve uh, next year? Uh, I don't think I can specifically answer that question without knowing which of the which of the categories 
of courtesy rider uh, that would be, but uh, we we are hoping that uh, that the the process will look different next year. But uh, you'll recall in uh, AP five sixty that uh, the priority the priority is first for um, the priority is forced for students attending their catchment school. And so if uh, if the bus is full at the end of registration and uh, it is wait, it, it may be possible to wait. It may be necessary to wait list. Uh, wait list uh, registrations. Uh, the the only reason that hasn't happened in the past is uh, not because the policy was different. It's because uh, there were less registrations, and so uh, if you were registering your student as a courtesy rider, you are not guaranteed service. And if you're registering as a courtesy rider, not attending a district program, uh, you may have to wait until October 1st until you hear whether there's a space. But even if you are attending a district program, you you may be uh, you may be. Uh, waitlisted uh, until a space becomes available. So it, it really depends on the capacity of those routes. And then the next question, why is it a limited system? How can you say it's not possible for everyone to ride a bus? What are the specific and tangible, tangible obstacles to providing bus transportation to everyone who wants it? Does it all fall on funding? And if so, what is the exact funding amount you need to transport everyone? It seems very concerning for you to say it's not possible, as clearly it is. Uh, yeah, with enough money, uh, anything is uh, technically possible. Uh, but the funding, the funding envelope for school boards is limited. School boards are not required to have a transportation uh, service at all. And so uh, what school boards uh, establish is is by policy and it's a it is a difficult choice between investing uh, funding into classroom supports, teachers, uh, support for students with vulnerable needs, uh, uh, education assistance, uh, resources in classrooms, uh, and uh, versus transportation, and so uh, it it it's uh, a challenge that every single school district has. Uh, there is no school district I know of in the province who uh, doesn't have a uh, doesn't have a system that that isn't able to uh, uh, address every transportation need. And uh, as I noted earlier through the through the survey, uh, we actually transport more students than most other districts uh, like us. And so uh, we are transporting a lot of students, but we're not. Uh, but at the end of the day, the system is limited, and that's 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 simply the reality. Uh, and uh, uh, it, as I said, it's uh, uh, the the amount that's established in the transportation budget is a decision of the board, but it's it is a very very difficult decision, and, and a number of priorities and factors needs needs to be weighed. So I think I'm through all the questions, and we're uh, we're at eight thirty, and uh, there uh, there were uh, twenty one uh, community members that registered. Uh, that were in attendance for this uh, for this meeting this evening, and I, I just want to thank uh, each of you for for joining. Uh, at, as I said at the beginning, uh, we know how important this policy is uh, for parents uh, and families, and uh, these are not uh, these are not decisions that the board takes takes lightly. And so, uh, we appreciate uh, the input you provided tonight, and. Uh, Tomorrow uh, we will post a, a survey link on on the on the website on the on the same page where you found the link for this for this meeting, and that survey link will be open for uh, for a few weeks. And I, I encourage you to uh, take the time and and uh, provide uh, provide 
uh, your feedback and your thoughts on on how uh, how the board can um, use the system that we have in the in the way that's the, the most effective and, and equitable. So uh, I want to thank you again for joining us tonight. And uh, at this time, uh, uh, I'm going to close the meeting and, and say good night. Thanks again.